Episode 32. This is part four of Bites and Stings. And in this one, we're going to talk about the venomous snakes of North America. Uh, so I'm not going to tackle any other continents or uh, countries. Uh, just basically speaking of uh, what's uh, in North America, there's two main groups of snakes. There's the uh, crotalids and the elapids. Uh, so let's talk about the crotalids first. These are pit vipers. Uh, and in the pit viper family, there are your rattlesnakes, your copperheads, and your water moccasins. Uh, so those are the three main types of uh, uh, crotalids that we have. And they're pit vipers because of this little pit that they have between their nostril and their eye. And this is a heat see, uh, sensing organ uh, that helps them when they're finding prey and making their strike. Uh, they use this little heat seeker. Uh, and if you get bitten by one of these, uh, they've had the retractable fangs. They're sort of the hypodermic needles and inject the poison into you. Um, and it's this complex soup of a whole bunch of different enzymes. And these enzymes will do different things. One breaks down the local tissue, so it's kind of starting the digestion process. You get this uh, vascular damage. Uh, so all throughout the body. Systemic means throughout the body. So this vascular damage throughout the body makes all your blood vessels get real leaky. And so you can have fluid move from your uh, blood system out into the tissues. And this can cause drop in blood pressure because uh, you don't have as much circulating fluid going around. Uh, it does something called hemolysis, which basically destroys red blood cells. And red blood cells are the ones that carry oxygen to all your tissues. So if you break down a lot of red blood cells, that can definitely lead to some issues with uh, not getting enough oxygen flow. Uh, it breaks down fibrin, uh, so it can consume uh, clot-forming uh, materials. Uh, so uh, you can lose your ability to, to stop bleeding and to uh, lose your ability to form clots. And some of them actually have neuromuscular effects, uh, like the Western... Uh, or the timber rattler, rather, uh, where you can get more of a muscle paralysis. Uh, and so different snakes will have different amounts of the enzymes, and, and so one bite will, you know, be more systemic vascular damage, another can have, a, you know, more hemolysis. So it all depends on the particular snake, but uh, all the pit vipers will have, you know, some degree of this soup of uh, enzymes. Now, if you get bitten by a pit viper, uh, a quarter of them can be dry bites, um, but you may not know that it's a dry bite. It could be an actual envenomation, and you have to watch somebody for about six to eight hours. So if you think it's a dry bite, they got fang marks, they saw the snake, but they don't have show any signs or symptoms of the uh, envenomation, you, you, you can't just blow it off. You have to actually watch and monitor them for about six to eight hours before you can safely say, all right, this is a dry bite, and they'd be safe to go home or go about their business. So what are the symptoms if you get envenomated? Well, there's a lot of local tissue effects. You get a lot of pain at the site and swelling. Uh, in terms of the kind of global symptoms you can get, you can get nausea and vomiting. That's very common. Uh, weakness if it's some of the neuromuscular effects. The uh, oral numbness, so uh, kind of tingling around your mouth and tongue. Again, this is that neuromuscular enzyme. Uh, dizziness can be, you know, the low blood pressure. Uh, Muscle tremors, uh, also called fasciculations, where you get uh, these little small twitches of these uh, different muscles. And in bad cases, you get altered consciousness, so you get real goofy, kind of whacked out of your head. Now, I'm going to show some pictures, so this is fair warning. If, you, if you're if you squeamish, some of these next pictures are kind of nasty, but this will show you what uh, untreated uh, pit viper bites can look like. And mostly this is rattlesnakes. Uh, I've seen a lot of copperhead bites, and most of the time I don't have to treat them with the anti-venom. Uh, you can just kind of watch them, and, and they do okay. Uh, the rattlesnakes, however, if you've got an envenomation from a rattlesnake, I always treat with the anti-venom. Uh, and here's what we're talking about. This is somebody's arm, and you can see all the swelling and blistering that's developing. Here's somebody that tagged on the thumb, and you know, the thumb's basically being digested already by uh, the venom. Here's a, uh, you know, a bite on a foot. Uh, you can kind of see where one of the, there's two fang marks. One's a small one on the uh, the right fang mark, the left fang mark. You can see more tissue destruction. And then you've got these blood-filled blisters that are forming and all the swelling that, that's uh, accompanied with it. 
here's somebody who got bit on the hand and you can just see the necrosis and just the dying of all the tissue of the hand uh, you can just see the raw muscle underneath and the skin's basically has sloughed off and fallen off so if uh, somebody you're with gets bitten by a, a pit viper um, here's some things not to do the old uh, back way back when I was young the Boy Scout uh, cut and suck little kit that they have where you make an X over the bite and you use this little uh, rubber sucker thing to get the venom out that's worthless it doesn't work at all so trying to cut the bite site and help get the venom out by either letting them bleed or by applying some kind of suction is absolutely 100% worthless uh, you cause more damage than you would ever possibly hope to do good so just go ahead and kill that one off the other thing that we would see uh, back when I was working in Phoenix is people would take uh, jumper cables and a car battery and uh, touch the bite area thinking that if they applied electricity that it would inactivate the venom. Uh, again, that's a bad idea. It doesn't work. <laughs> you can only uh, lead to additional problems by uh, electrocuting your patient. Uh, and the third thing is don't apply a tight tourniquet. Uh, we'll talk about constrictor bands here in a little bit, uh, but uh, tourniquet to the point where you shut off arterial supply um, to the affected area is not a good idea. So tourniquets, electrocution, and the cut and suck method, uh, not worth it. What can you do? Well, uh, just in terms of first aid, you immobilize the limb. All right, so if it's an arm or a leg, you just uh, put, you could put a makeshift splint on it, uh, kind of get it in a neutral position, you know, so about the level of the heart. And then if medical care is not going to be available for a while, you can put some constriction bands on. Uh, so this does not cause a loss of pulse. It's not so tight that you don't have um, arterial flow, uh, but it is tight enough that it limits the venous return uh, so you don't get some of the venom coming uh, throughout the body and try and keep it more in the local area. Now some people argue that if you keep the venom in a local area you're going to get a lot more local tissue destruction uh, and there is some truth to that uh, but the thought process behind that is preventing these uh, more systemic or more global effects that uh, work throughout the entire body. Now the mainstay for all the pit vipers or the significant pit viper uh, envenomations and again all my rattlesnake bites get this therapy. I wait and see how things progress with the copperheads. Water moccasins I actually rarely see and but rattlesnakes are bad. Uh, the antivenom is the mainstay. Uh, there's something called Crofab um, which is a sheep derived antibody so basically they take these sheep and they uh, inject rattlesnake and copperhead venom and water moccasin venom into them. Uh, they let them develop antibodies and then they collect these antibodies and that's what you sell. Uh, now if you happen to get bitten you're going to get somewhere between four and six vials over an hour and then we're going to monitor and if you're still getting worse we're going to give you another four to six vials. And now the problem uh, with one of the side effects is bankruptcy because you can see that each vial is 800 bucks that's wholesale that's not what the hospital is going to charge you're going to get a jacked up charge uh, so this is a very very expensive treatment now what is a uh, uh, antibody and what's this FAB thing that we're talking about well the antibody has several subunits the FAB is this main portion of the antibody this is what actually binds to the toxin uh, it cleaves off the FC portion which um, is responsible for a lot of the allergic reactions that people get uh, when the, you give them a horse serum or, or sheep serum based product. So again if you're delayed in treatment what are some things you can do? Well monitoring the patient again keeping them uh, in a neutral position and measuring the circumference of the limb both above and below the bite. Uh, and then it, marking the border of the swelling. You do this with like a Sharpie um, and you write on the person, you write the, the time uh, that you did it and you write the measurement uh, so you can kind of track that. For, for those that are in the medical field, 
We also monitor labs every four hours, and that's going to be a complete blood count. So I'm looking at your platelets, looking at your red blood cell count. Uh, the PT and PTT are measurements of how well your blood can clot. So basically, I'm looking for the effects of the destruction of the ability to form clots. Fibrinogen is one of the byproducts of that, and a fibrin degradation product, FDP. Looking for electrolyte shifts. Uh, obviously managing glucose because you could drop your glucose with uh, severe stress. Uh, BUN is a uh, uh, blood urea nitrogen to see if your kidneys are running into problems and in creatine phosphokinase looking for just muscle damage markers. So that's what uh, we're going to do from a medical stance. Here's an example of uh, marking on a patient. Uh, you can see this purple uh, surgical pen. Uh, so they're measuring things and putting the time and the measurements so they can track how this is uh, progressing. The bite was on the foot and it's kind of marching up the leg. Now here's a, a patient of mine uh, that got bit with a western diamond back on his uh, right index finger. You can see the two puncture wounds. Again, the left puncture wound smaller than the right puncture wound. There's more tissue effect. We've, he just came in, so that was the first mark uh, of the swelling of his hand. The clear bag here is the crofab. The covered bag, the brown bag, is epinephrine. Uh, we have that just ready to go in case he starts developing an allergic reaction. Uh, again, the old uh, serum-based uh, antivenom had lots of allergic reactions. This new crofab uh, is much better, a lot fewer uh, reactions related to that. Uh, so this guy did really well. Uh, got his, uh, uh, I forgot whether it was four or six vials. Uh, washed him. Uh, that was enough. Uh, he got admitted to the hospital for continuing monitoring to make sure this didn't progress uh, and went home and didn't have much more than the effects you see here. Uh, so Crofab uh, is a huge boon to the treatment of rattlesnake bites because without it, those other pictures with the severe tissue destruction, that's more in line with what we would see in the past. All right, let's talk about the uh, alapid that uh, is in North America. This is the coral snake. This is the red on yellow killifello, uh, as opposed to the, uh, uh, the king snake uh, has red on black, uh, venom lac. Um, now that moniker is only true for North America. There are some South American snakes that have red and black together that are very venomous. Uh, but again, I'm focusing just on North America. So if you have red touching yellow, uh, that is a venomous snake. Now, the coral snakes don't have two large hypodermic needles like uh, the rattlesnakes and copperheads. Uh, so these have to have a more secure, strong bite and be on you for a little bit in order to get a significant envenomation. Um, so severe envenomations of coral snakes in the United States is actually very rare. Uh, they have to basically get on you, bite down hold it for a while and let the venom get in. I actually had one of these coral snakes crawling across my driveway a couple weeks ago. Very pretty snakes. Um, this is primarily a neurotoxin, the venom is, uh, similar to that of a cobra. And the problem that you get is, is paralysis. And if you paralyze the diaphragm, then the patient quits breathing, which is not a good thing. Um, if you have an envenomation just like the rattlesnakes, uh, you may not see effects for several hours. Um, and if you have a definite bite of a coral snake, uh, they go ahead and just say treat it with the antivenin uh, because if you don't do it uh, and the effects take hold, you may not be able to reverse them. And if you get paralyzed, you wind up on a ventilator uh, until the venom wears off. So you be in the ICU on a breathing machine for a period of time. Um, so as you can see, the field treatment of significant snake bites is pretty limited. There's not a lot that you can do simply with first aid without advanced medicine. Um, that's why in the old Western movies and the books, you know, getting bit by a rattlesnake was a huge deal. Getting bit by a rattlesnake today with modern medicine is not as much of a big deal uh, just because we have these, these uh, more advanced treatments. So, again, if you're in a situation where, you know, you're at the bottom of the Grand Canyon hiking, you, know, you don't have a sat phone, you're not going to be able to hike out, there's nobody around, this could be a very significant problem. 
Uh, so what you do is just kind of basic supportive treatment uh, from what you can. Make sure they're hydrated. Make sure the limb is in a neutral position. Consider uh, constriction bands. Again, not so tight that you don't get uh, arterial blood flow. Uh, and try and get them to um, advance medical care as soon as possible. Uh, but with the invent of these CROFAB uh, antibodies, uh, that's really changed uh, the ability for us to treat these uh, significant envenomations. So that concludes the series on bites and stings. Uh, thanks again for watching. Um, the next group of videos is going to be on bioterrorism. Uh, so we'll start putting those together here shortly. Thanks again. Bye.